Tim Stevens is the editor-in-chief. I'm Brian Cooley, editor-at-large, and joining us now is Dr. Michael Hoffner, who's the director of driver assistance systems and active safety at Mercedes. That covers quite a bit of interesting stuff. Yeah, absolutely, a lot of in interesting stuff. Now, we've been uh, talking about the E-Class a lot. That's one of the major cars here unveiled the show. A lot of interesting technology in that car. Can you walk us through the autonomous functions in that car? In what situations does it work? How fast can you go? And how long can you take your hands off the wheel for? Well, yeah, we have uh, introduced the driver assistant package uh, plus in this vehicle and, and brought the whole uh, auto autonomy on the next level. Um, it's still semi-automated. This is due to regulations uh, and, and also to, you know, some technology that needs to be further developed. Um, we have introduced the drive pilot, uh, which is capable of helping to keep the distance, to steering, to detect speed limits, and automatically take them in your speed and cruise control. So you get a lot of comfort and, and support in your driving. So the car will automatically adjust itself based on speed limits, based on distance from other cars, and stay within the lane, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you turn the system on, uh, you know, um, the car brakes and accelerates uh, on its own. <laughs> It keeps the, the speed, it helps steering. We even were able to introduce a lane, fun lane change functionality that supports mm. you in changing lanes on, uh, on specific mm. roads. Now, um, there have been cars already that have had, including many of yours, that have had active lane keep assist, but if you take your hands off the wheel, they quickly warn you, get back on the wheel. What's the behavioral programming of this new system? Is it going to allow me to keep my hands off the wheel for some duration? Um, it, for some duration is a correct uh, wording. We are not allowed re regulatory wise uh, that the customer has uh, to put the hands off the wheel mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to, to remind the driver uh, from time to time to keep his hands back on the steering wheel and the eyes on the road. Um, but we have an intelligent so-called tense of detection uh, that kind of looks on what the road is. Um, if it's very straight, we allow a little longer and that keeps you up mm. to um, 30 seconds or a minute of time ah, okay. um, until you are still reminded and, and really have to go back on driving, otherwise we would have an emergency stop of the car. Is that something that you can disable? I know Tesla has a little checkbox that you can actually turn that off entirely if you want to. No, I'm sorry we are not allowed to disable that <laughs> functionality, even if many customers would love it, but you mm -hmm. know there is something behind this and, and that is um, semi-automation means the driver still is in control. Right. Mm -hmm. The vehicle can run in 99 thought something percent uh, of the driving very accurately, but at the very moment that there is something, you need the driver needs to be able to take over control. And there is where the biggest discussion is going on that I hear around autonomous driving, Dr. Hoffner, is the, uh, the relationship over the next, what, 10 years mm -hmm. of semi-autonomous, when the car will at some times need to throw it back to us, assume that we're engaged and ready to take that role, that is a treacherous area going forward. How are you going to work that out that you're going to give me fair notice that I have to get involved? Because I assume it's going to be at a time when there's something urgent about to happen, not something routine. Yeah, and uh, what we need to do in order to do the next step is that we really are sure the car is able to drive by its own for, for a time. And we probably will start to have the highly automated functions on specific roads only. So where we really are sure that we know everything, that the maps are accurate, um, that the sensors see enough, uh, even we are then connected with, uh, with the back-end server, so we really know for a time that we can allow the driver to go out of the loop for, for some time and, and that he is also allowed some time, a few seconds, before he really needs to go back. We will not okay. ask a highly automated driving that we will introduce later the, the driver to be responsible again within a, a millisecond. And will the car rely on any sensors to detect the awareness of the driver, whether it be heart rate or simply to see if they're looking at the road? Um, we are planning to have some monitoring in a way that the driver is not falling asleep or something. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, because in, in a couple of seconds, we want the driver to be able to take over if, you know, if, if lanes merge or if there is something, if he wants to leave a specific road, we probably introduce such things on highways only. So mm -hmm. if he want to leave the highway, we would, remind uh, a while ago, a, a while before leaving the highway, that the driver should take over control. So um, that is done by the system then. Mm. Uh, let's turn now from the uh, self-driving tech to one that we're fascinated by, right. which is your new car to X communication, the first series production car that has the ability to talk to other entities in terms of a digital discussion of its actual logistics and movement. What is the core of that? What have you built into the car? You know, we thought it was 
about time to, to stop the NHEC problem and somebody now had to, to start really establishing the communication. What we do in this car is that we use the communication uh, like uh, over telephone and smartphone to our backend server. So information out of the car is sent via the communication module in, in our backend server and the mm -hmm. backend server then aggregates and interprets the information mm -hmm. and sends it back to other vehicles um, that need the information. Like for example, if we detect icy roads, we send that information up where it is, um, and then other vehicles that would come to that location get a pre-warning that there are icy roads ahead. So this is not a formal implementation of the 802.11 car-to-car standard that's being developed right now, correct? It, it's not a direct car-to-car -car at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to be another step in the, in the mm -hmm. future. Um, with the current system, there is a little latency, but for many, many functionalities mm -hmm. like icy roads or accidents, construction areas, it makes a lot of sense, and you can do a lot of good functionalities mm -hmm. with a little latency. All right, so these uh, 2017 E-Class cars have an embedded radio that is gathering road and condition information that they can determine, sending that up to a centralized Mercedes server that is shared with other 2017 E-Class at this point. Exactly, that's the way we start, but yes. we are open to include like other OEMs or um, even more to get more vehicles sending up information. Uh, the more vehicles send up information, the more you know about the mm -hmm. roads, mm -hmm. and the more vehicles can share and, and use that information. What do you want to see happen in terms of the regulatory fabric, whether it's for car-to-car -car communications, whether it's for rules about autonomy? I know car makers are pretty disturbed that in the United States we're going state by state with laws and regulations. I assume you'd rather see a single blanket federal policy. Mm -hmm. And is, there, is it feasible to even look for a global set of regulations, or is that asking too much? It would, it's still a big wish for all OEMs probably to have worldwide regulations, um, but I know we have to live with what's happening, and um, in, in general we see a lot of support from regulatory um, uh, activities um, to really make autonomous driving possible. So um, it's not that we have to, to argue too much, it's a it's a common thing, so mm -hmm. there's no, no point to, um, to, to be unhappy about this. Uh, it would, of course, be better if we had something nationwide or worldwide that would always mm -hmm. be better because you, you don't have to develop different technologies, but for the moment we can live with the progress that's been done. And one area that we've seen different le legislation internationally versus here has been in the ability to park your car without being in your car. BMW has that in the 7 Series internationally, where you can get out of the car, take your remote control on your key fob, and steer the car into your parking garage effectively. The E-Class has this as well, but on BMW, they had to disable it here in the United States, but it sounds like the E-Class, you will be able to do that here in the U.S. Is there some questionable legality there, or is there any reason that, that you guys can do it, but BMW can't do it? I don't know the ex uh, exact reasons um, why or if BMW did mm -hmm. or did not introduce the system here. Um, it's at the end all about your safety concept, probably. I, I mean, um, we are introducing our system with a smartphone uh, communication. Mm -hmm. Um, and make the driver always being active, so you don't have just to push something, but you, you need to do some specific gestures in, mm -hmm. in, in order to keep the car running okay. and have to observe what's happening. Um, so probably it's about the overall concept that, that you have and that whether or not makes it regulatory mm. feasible. Uh, mm. I am not aware of a regulation in the US that would not allow to do that. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what do you tell people that are skeptical about self-driving. There are many responses we get from users. <laughs> they tend to fall in three buckets. One, I'm a good driver, we all think. Two, I like to drive. And three, I don't trust computers. Those are three pushbacks we get from a lot of consumers, especially mainstream people who are not technology forward. Mm -hmm. How do you think your company will address those three areas of I guess fear and doubt. I think all the three um, options and, and uh, opinions are fair to have. Um, our answer is, you know, it's just uh, a proposal, uh, an offer that we make with, with uh, automated driving. All the cars that will, um, that will offer you automated driving can manually be steered to. So there is no, mm. no need that you have to, to use it. Uh, you can always drive by yourself if you love. And, and, and want to do so. And going forward, what's the balance going to be in, in, when we're talking about improving the safety of a Mercedes-Benz? What's the balance between active safety and, and ultimately trying to, you know, providing more airbags, providing safer, 
systems within the car versus more autonomous functionality to avoid accidents, which is going to have the biggest gains when it comes to actually reducing fatalities and reducing injuries on the road? I mean, the safety functions that we've introduced, and they are always active in the background, they uh, continue to have the biggest impact that driving gets more and more safe. Um, and we'll continue to push and, and move forward with those active safety systems. Um, and they are also a basis to run cars autonomously. There is no question, nobody wants to have an accident with autonomous driving, and we put mm -hmm. a lot of effort um, that this can be achieved uh, also. Mm -hmm. It seems as though with the, uh, with the passive systems, like airbags, and, or with uh, anti-lock brakes and stability control, we seem to have hit a floor and have pushed accidents, at least in the United States, we've pushed accidents down about as far as we can in terms of annual rate. We're in the low 30,000s fatalities per year, and have been there for a few years. Is the only breakthrough left going to be semi-autonomy and advanced driver assist? At least the one with, with the most effect to gain in the next couple of years. We have introduced our automatic emergency braking systems um, in series in the US and Europe. Um, and we see a big gain yeah. uh, if the car really automatically brakes, so mm -hmm. there is still more accidents that we can, can avoid. And the more uh, safety functionalities you, you put into your cars, well, like for example, we have introduced now an evasive steer assist that supports your um, uh, maneuver if you want to avoid an accident with a pedestrian, mm, yeah, that you don't oversteer extreme. or understeer. Yes. Um, and, and there are still a few ideas left, or many ideas left, uh, where we further can optimize safety functionalities in vehicles. And on that basis, we can then also start um, automated driving. And presumably that then means that things like insurance rates are going to go down as well. Can you give me your thoughts on questions about liability and what the future holds there when we're talking about an autonomous car crashing into another autonomous car or a, a, a non-autonomous car crashing into an autonomous car? Well, you have to design your system in a way that, of course, uh, you have redundancy in your system. Mm -hmm. The system must be absolutely reliable if it runs autonomously, no question about it. So that's why we will also have other sensors equipped in the car. Mm -hmm. Currently, we do have stereo cameras and radars. Uh, for autonomous driving, we will add probably LIDARs uh, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have exact localization algorithms that we exactly know where the car is. We have accurate maps, so we know a lot of what's happening around the car and the central controller needs to calculate um, redundantly then too. Mm -hmm. uh, for we have redundant sensors, can make decisions two out of three or something if mm -hmm. one sensor isn't seeing accurately at the, uh, due to weather conditions or something. Um, and also the algorithms run um, redundantly, so we really are sure that there is no error in the system. I was intrigued by remarks at CES by a, a counterpart of yours in the industry, Gil Pratt over at Toyota, who says uh, he believes the biggest uh, work that'll be done to convince buyers, regulators, and insurers that autonomous or highly adapt, uh, highly assistive car systems will work is to expose how the cars make their decisions. Not just to show great results, but to go to the black box in the middle that got there and expose that so everyone can see how they're doing what they do. do you, what's your take on that? Is how useful that will be in this social journey we're taking? I would support uh, him in saying that we need transparency in what the car does in a very specific situation. Um, that will help that, that we get a common and a social consensus on, on how we implement algorithms. Um, so that's a fair way to go. Okay. Another way to gain confidence from the customers, of course, is that they start trying the systems, uh, for mm -hmm. example, in traffic jams at low speeds, and they gain confidence mm -hmm. by using it. Um, and the, the more you use it, uh, the more confidence you gain. Mm -hmm. I think that helps mm -hmm. also in order to to knowing and, and getting to know the system and then use it. Yeah, I don't know about the first time you tried adaptive cruise control. Oh, it's a little nerve wracking. Didn't want to trust it the first time, mm -hmm. right? Especially when there's a car ahead of you slowing down. And yeah. You think, okay, I'll get my foot right on the brake, ready to go, just in case. But all of a sudden, it's like, wow, that really works. And then all of a sudden, you trust it. It's, it's very, very nice. Yeah. What would you say would be the next step beyond where we are now? So we've seen the speed, the speed limits increasing for these systems. You can now go faster on the highway in a semi-autonomous mode. What will be the next logical step? Because it won't be an overnight jump from here to a fully autonomous car. How do you think the system will take the next step from here? Yeah, uh, the, big, the big next step that we want to make is that, that we use more and more map data um, because we see that mm -hmm. map data is also getting more and more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, today, we don't judge it to, to be accurate enough for many algorithms. I know if, if there's a roundabout in the map, uh, but there isn't one or vice versa, mm -hmm. the car would, would do stupid things then. <laughs> so, um, that sounds like a bad thing. Uh, but also, you know, with a with a car to X technology, vehicles can send up information. Also, if they're when they are running on streets, so we really get knowledge and, and live data mm -hmm. where the streets are um, and and if there is any changes in the streets, 
Um, so we will gain accurate maps in the near future, and that will allow us to put, take them as another input into our algorithms and even have them being more sophisticated. And that's powered, of course, by the HERE consortium that recently finished the deal to nice. collaborate on strong, really excellent map data. That was one reason, yeah. And, let, no, and, and as you add LiDAR to these cars and add more accurate sensors, that means that these cars can effectively be building and rebuilding those maps as they're driving around, right? They can be scanning the train and, and beaming that data up to make sure that the map is updated instantly if anything changes. Exactly, yep. It's pretty fascinating. Before we let you go, we always like to ask a personal question. What are you driving from the Mercedes lineup these days? Well, I'm driving currently a sealless shooting brake. A oh, very nice car. Oh, very nice. We, don't, we don't get that. No, it's one of those things that you guys keep for yourselves over in Europe. Oh, a shooting brake. That would be nice to have. That would be nice. Uh, all right, well, let them know. We want that in the U.S. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We approve. All right, very good. All right, Dr. Michael Hoffner, he's in charge of uh, autonomous driving and driver-assist advanced technologies at Mercedes-Benz. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome.